Hi, Alex. Thanks for coming to the Investor Talk. It's my great pleasure having you. Hi, Massimiliano. Uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. So if you want to give a short intro to the founders, who you are. Yeah, I'm Alex, Managing Director of the German High Tech Gründer Fund. And we've been around now for almost 17 years. And uh, the idea is to uh, provide seed financing to tech startups. And our focus is seed. And then they're very broad. So we do anything that's high tech or very innovative. So it could be anything around hardware, sensors, semiconductors, energy, robotics, machinery, anything around life science and med tech and, and chemistry. And then of course, uh, software. And seed means the company needs to be younger than three years. And um, the funds we operate out of is a public-private partnership. So money comes from the German government and basically German industry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, I suppose your geography is Germany. Well, well, geography is German? No, not really. Theoretically, we can invest worldwide. So of yeah. course, the, the main focus is indeed Germany. It's like 80% of the investments. And 20% of the investments are mainly in Europe. Uh, so we have done investments in the UK, in Switzerland, in France, in Italy, and all over the place. There needs, needs to be a German angle. So there needs to be a German subsidiary or a German business reason. So yeah, it's mainly Germany, but also, um, also Europe, basically. Thank you. And how much do you do when invest? How much do we invest? We do 40 investments per year, so for zero. That's a lot. So we have done uh, 670 investments in the not 17 years. And how much do we invest? Uh, we are, the funds are very big. So the fund is 320 million, but our ticket size is small. So on average, we do like 650,000 in the seat ticket. And uh, it can go up to a million uh, in the in initial ticket. And then per company, we can invest up to 3 million. And uh, we're raising now the fourth fund, which will be a bit bigger than, than the third one. So we our ticket size can go up a little bit. But it's still seed, so we're not a growth investor. Thank you. I mean, uh, 40, that's a, a huge number. It's very, you need to be very focused on investing in 40 startups per year. So uh, what are the top concerns and where do you find convention when it comes investing in early stage, the company, the team, the product, for example? So key really is the team. So we're looking for founders um, who are themselves really convinced uh, and, and that, that show not only a vision, a large vision, but also a clear plan how to execute that vision. Because you need both. The vision needs to be large. It needs to solve a, a big problem. But you also need the you know, step-by-step -step details. And in order to like convince us, um, you know, it's the track record, what did the founders do before? It's the team. How complementary is the team? Uh, are they open for ideas? But then also, are they, are they really sticking to their convictions? So it's a mixture of um, you know, being open for input, but also uh, not getting um, off track because someone says something. So you know, we really like founders who are you know, convinced what they do. I mean, what about face-to-face -face meeting? We have been just, we are trying actually to be out of the pandemic. We are still a little bit there. And yeah. for the pandemic, face-to-face uh, -face was absolutely mandatory. If not mandatory, it was a big deal of the investment done. Now, as we are today, uh, be on the screen and talking on Zoom, whatever it is, pretty common. Uh, what's your take on this? How do you feel investing without even meeting the founders? It's a very good question. Before the pandemic, I, I, I said, you know, I would love to spend a week with the founders hiking in the Alps. To like from heart to heart, and then there's like maybe some difficulty, rain and bad weather, and, and then you really, really get to know the people. Of course, that's not possible, especially when you do 40 investments per year. So, so we 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 do try to meet uh, the team multiple times in, in person. So they come to us, we 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 visit them in their offices, and we try to spend a little bit, you know, free time with them. So you know, after the meeting, go for a beer or. Now, sometimes they, we go for a run if that you now just happens to make sense. So with the pandemic, we did learn, and that's quite amazing uh, still, 
that we could make an investment without ever having met the founders. Not very often, but but we, we did that, and it works. So so we learned that you know meeting through the screen does work. Yeah, I can see many had done investment even without meeting the founders. But what happens after the you have done the investment? How many times you meet them? We it depends. I mean, <clears throat> so 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 we're very hands on. So we're the lead investor. We try to to structure the deal. We try to really support the founders. And it really really depends on um, what they need. So sometimes you have like two physicists coming out of a research institution, out of university. And it's basically their first job. They haven't set up a company before. They have maybe have very little or no work experience. And um, they, they are leading expert in, in, in their technology, in their field worldwide. But then they haven't sold, they, they haven't, no, haven't sold, they haven't uh, recruited, they haven't set up a, a controlling and everything. So, so with those founders, they're very active supporting them directly, the investment managers, but also through like, partners that we have, maybe even consultants or, or very active business owners. So, but then on the other hand, <clears throat> there's founders that are doing a really good job. And I, I, I say the best thing you can do with those founders is just leave them alone. Don't steal their time by trying to support them. And, and I'm really convinced of that because uh, sometimes it's really best to, to just do nothing, <laughs> let them go. <laughs> uh, and and uh, so, so, you know, it, it, it's all about listening, understanding, and then uh, uh, targeting, uh, tailoring the support that they really need. And how involved did you get with these founders? Uh, do you meet them weekly or just when needed? It depends. We have a monthly reporting. So they, they write a, um, a little report what, what, what is really important. And um, I always say, you know, in that monthly report, there shouldn't be anything new. Here. So you should be in touch with the founders, uh, depending on what's happening. So if the, the head of sales, if, if, if he or she leaves and it shows up in the monthly report, that's not good because if, if the head of sales leaves, then <laughs> the founder should call you right away. So what you need is a relationship that, that covers the important stuff. So, and then of course, how often do you talk to each other? Like well, it depends. If, if nothing important is happening, leave them alone. And if if they have a big win, big sales win, or a big loss, or if the technology is delayed, or it's important people leave, then um, not every day sometimes. Now in the in the fundraising, if they if they're doing fundraising for the next round, uh, indeed, I think we we are in touch every day to support them you know, because it's tough you know, they get rejections and then we morally support them or we fine tune the pitch we we help them perfect the slide deck uh, you know whatever it takes so from every day to maybe once a month I mean, where do you think is the best way you can add value to your portfolio or companies yeah again it depends but but i think there's some things we are really good at so, so, so we have done you know, 670 investments, and, and this portfolio has done uh, almost 2,000 follow-on rounds. So we have a lot of transaction experience. So, so with that transaction experience, we know how a transaction works. We know uh, many, many investors, but we also know very. We understand very clearly in what state does a company uh, have to be in order to be able to to raise a, a follow-on round so 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 maybe the founders have done one financing round which is maybe our seed round and we have done more than two thousand so so with that experience we can we can support them a lot we have done 150 exits so we know what's happening in the exit process so if a, a company um, approaches um uh, you know the exit phase we can really support them because for, for the founders maybe it's the first exit for us it's number 160 five or so and <clears throat> we also have 33 uh, private fund investors like large and medium-sized and, and, and some small uh, companies so uh, <clears throat> it's very very easy for us to open doors um, and with, to our fund investors it's very very easy to open doors to other companies that we know for many many years so we do uh, some sort of maybe you know in a way you know 
business development or sometimes even pre-sales. And, uh, and that's easy. That's really easy uh, for us. And then uh, you know, sometimes supporting the sales cycle, it, it, it cuts the sales cycle from one year and three months to three months <laughs> uh, for the founders, which is, of course, very valuable. Absolutely. I mean, what about the lead? You said you are, you are a lead investor. What should be the key points for a lead investor to keep in mind when start uh, leading around? I think in the seed phase, it's really important that the company is set up properly. So the IP needs to be in the company. We need to have a, a clear uh, legal setup. Uh, I think we, we, we're, we're making sure that the shares are uh, distributed in a way that, that the company um, stays attractive for follow-on investors. So what do I mean? Sometimes we have seen out of university, for example, that that the professors had like 60% of the shares and the founders had 40%. Yeah. That's maybe not a good setup um, uh, uh, for the next round because the, the, the VCs, they would say, well, the founders have too few shares. So what we do then is we distribute the shares from that example from the professors uh, to the founders. So so basically we, we, we make sure that the company has a setup that is um, attractive for follow-on founders. And then we support, we, as I said, we really understand uh, what's the, the state the company has to, to achieve. And then we support the founders to, to achieve that state. So for example, uh, you know, we might believe that the company should have at least like say half a million revenue. And then you know, like very often in the software space, you know, you need some traction for an A round. And then, and then we really, really support the founders uh, and I had them re- the head of sales, the sales team. Uh, we, we maybe have sales consultants who, who help them, uh, you know, getting the, 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 the sales process and, and pitch and everything right. So, so and then if it works, then we just go away. Now we, uh, we just uh, withdraw a bit. So we are in the, in, the, in the lead, especially into the A round. And then ideally then a, a a, a big VC comes in and he takes over the lead and then we step back a bit because it makes sense to have just one lead. We, we still follow the company quite closely, try to understand what's happening and maybe we can still help a bit, but then we hand over the lead role to the next investor. Thank you. I mean, you say you invest early. What happened? You said already you had this startup uh, to you get involved. How do you get involved exactly? When it comes to the following round in introducing other investors, how does it work? We have a big, 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 big Rolodex of many, many investors. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's like more than four billion has been invested in our portfolio and follow-on rounds, and that's many, many, many investors. So we know them. We make introductions. Uh, we um, we find the right investors because we know this investor. Type A, he's looking for these companies, and investor Type B is looking for other companies. So we we save the portfolio, the the search phase, the screening phase. Who's the right investor for us? Because we from from the past we we have some understanding for that. So basically, we shortcut um, the the way that the founders take to, to find the next investor. And I think lots of um, <clears throat> support also is motivation. Because fundraising is tough and, you know, you get maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 rejections before you get an interest, a term sheet. And um, if uh, if you have 25 rejections, uh, you, know, you know, founders might lose faith or might get depressed or um, lose energy and we just support them, <laughs> give them energy. Uh, and and we, we, we introduce them to other founders who have the same experience and then, and then it just keeps keeps the flow going. Yeah, you need to guess to with a no, no, no before the sea is coming. Yeah. <laughs> we get so many no, but it's fine. <laughs> they need to and, know. And, and, and we have the same experience. So so we are fundraising now for our fourth fund. And and uh, and we do have people we talk to <laughs> and they seem to be interested and then they never call back. <laughs> uh, there's a new term it's called ghosting so so they treat you as if you were a ghost they don't see you anymore and that's okay i mean that's because everybody's busy and then there's something that's corona and, and the family and then they just forget to come back 
this. But um, that's happening a lot to founders, uh, and 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 we tell them it's nothing personal. It's just part of the deal, and don't take it too serious. And and also tell them, well, if someone doesn't call back, call them again and again and again, and then they all then they call back, and then all of a sudden maybe they invest. That's true. How do you expect your investments to help your portfolio? Should they have interactions to some extent? A lot. So, so um, um, many years ago, like 15 years ago, we, we, um, um, we set up a, a huge conference and we call it the family day. It's our, our portfolio day. And basically what we do, we invite all our portfolio companies and all the founders, but also investors and uh, network partners, uh, people we know that you know could help, like possible board members and everything. So, so we are, and it's a thousand people, so it's a lot. And many people they come out to Bonn. Uh, next time will be June 14th and 15th, so uh, in, a, in about a month. And um, and it's a matchmaking between portfolio companies and investors, but it's also a matchmaking uh, among portfolio companies. And and there's later stage companies they can share their they can share their um, experience. Um, and there's, there's, uh, they can use each other products sometimes. And uh, we try to get as much out of the ecosystem as possible. Uh, and uh, for example, another point, I think it's really important. We have set up something that we call HGGF Academy. And here we systematically share know-how. So what are the, the, the rights and obligations of a managing director? So it's important to understand because if you make a big mistake, uh, it could be costly. But <clears throat> we also um, share the know-how within the portfolio. So a company, one of our companies just went public on NASDAQ First North. And it was very difficult. Uh, it was one day after the Ukraine war started. And, and, but it worked. So, so two weeks after they went public, we put them in the, in the HGF Academy and invited the portfolio companies and said, well, you can talk to them. They can tell you about the experience, how they went public. Uh, you can ask any question, you can learn, uh, and maybe you can also go public. And, and everything we learn, we try to recycle uh, in a way that it benefits everybody. What's your take on pivoting? During the pandemic, pivoting is probably the most spoken uh, word. I mean, pivoting, pivoting was a pure disaster as soon as the pandemic started. Uh, what do you think about pivoting and how the founders should approach failing? Because many of them, they fail. There's nothing to do. It's a very good question. And, and you know, when you ask investors, what's the most important success factor? They all say team, 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 team. That's the most important. And many, many years, uh, for many, many years, I asked myself, but then there's many aspects of team. It's like the age, the gender, the experience. Within the team, what's the most important um, aspect. And <clears throat> we found out the most important aspect of a team is the ability to pivot. Yeah. Why? Uh, it, it, and being smart helps, being hardworking helps. It's all important. But the ability to pivot is the key. Why? I think 95, 98, 99% of all the startups, when they start, they don't have the exactly right direction. Most of them have the wrong direction. They, they just start and they just go in a direction. And if they keep going, they fail or become just moderately successful. And the good startups, they recognize, well, that's the totally wrong direction. Let's change the direction, which is a pivot. Or even if it's the right direction, but not the perfectly right direction, let's adjust the direction. And the ability of the team to realize well, we're not on the, uh, on the perfect uh, uh, track. And let's, let's change the track a bit. That's the key, regardless. It's, it, and there's many examples, like, you know, big, like I, I think um, YouTube started as a I don't know, gaming company or, or you know, um, Shopify, they sold well, the snowboard shop, but then it, it was a pivot, they became, they became Shopify. So, so there's many famous examples and I think the ability to pivot is key because even if you hit the right direction perfectly at some point, then the environment changes, you need to adjust again. And, and 
and you know, and, and you need to adjust because there's corona, because there's war, because there's inflation, because there's innovation that changes everything. So being able to constantly and always pivot is the number one success factor, I think. I agree. But what's your advice to founders when they start? How they should mentor approach value? Because it can, can happen pretty easily, actually. I, I, I think in Germany, we do have the ten tendency to over-engineer. So we think, and then we optimize, 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 and then, then we have the perfect result, and then we start. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think the, the Americans. <laughs> and I think the American approach is to think a little bit and then just go and, and just do it, which is like, you know, the next slogan and everything. So I think the advice is to, um, to think a bit, yes, but then to, to start to, to get things done and learn along the way and then adjust and maybe even, even pivot. pivot. And in the learning along the way, I think it's really the, the balance of, perseverance not, not giving up and and sticking to and not giving up sticking to your goal on one side and then on the other side being open for you know influence advice and and adjusting and i think that there's no golden rule i think that's the that's the the art of being an entrepreneur to not ride at that horse forever uh, but also to not give up too early it does why do you become an investor? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I always have been a multitasking person. So I really, really like um, the situation where you know, it has not just one company, but maybe like five or 10 companies. Uh, that, and, and also, I think being an investor is fascinating because it's all about innovation. It, and innovation never ends. It, it, it will always continue. It will always accelerate. So, so being able to, you know, um, understand, to really, um, to, um, to, to accept innovation and turn innovation into a valuable business, I think it's one of the most fascinating things you can do. And even if things fail, which of course is the case, the net effect is very positive. So, so, so uh, you know, unless you totally fail as an investor, but, but typically, the positive aspects are much larger than the negative aspects. So, so you know, out of almost nothing, you know, together, of course, with the founders and everybody else involved, you know, there's a lot of value being created, and you can really see uh, like a, a little, little, little chunk of value getting bigger every day. I think it's fascinating. So, working for a large corporation also is fascinating, but you know sometimes they don't create much value, and the value is getting smaller all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with startups, with startups, innovation now value is, is is growing, and that's fascinating. Innovation is fascinating. Founders are dynamic, are very, I mean, very uh, sometimes very un uncomfortable, but always very interesting uh, personalities. And uh, just recently, you know, when you when you listen to Elon Musk and, and maybe other of the very famous founders, you know, you might not like them, uh, yeah. but they're still very fascinating in, in their does. personality. It does, it does. I mean, for again, 40 startups per year, it's an absolutely massive number. So you had to have on average three, four investments per month, which is seriously a lot, one per week. And my question is, which are the critical points? Because Making so many investments, you had you had to decide quite quickly. Even though if you can have even 30, 40, 50 members in your team, you still need to decide quickly. Which are the critical points that trigger your say, yes, let's do with these guys? Yeah, first of all, we are we are as uh, HGF large team. So we basically we decentralize the investment approach away from the senior leadership, away from the partners into the investment team. So so the critical point really is to enable the investment team to push the investment. Ahead. So um, th that's for our organization. And then in terms of investment, it is the team. It's really the people who drive it. Uh, and, and But also, of course, there's a combination. Do they solve a large problem? Also, again, in Germany, we tend to optimize a, 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 an existing problem. It's more like a feature and not like a, a big solution. So if the, the problem you're addressing is not, not big enough, then the company, of course, cannot grow significantly. 
So, so, and then the, of course the way you do it you now is there a uh, a unique uniqueness in your solution in the technology. You now all of the stuff you know the competition and you know, is there a business model? But in the end, I think you need really need to understand and and sort of like the the problem the you know, the solution the team is addressing, and then of course the team. Uh, and then with the team, as I said, you know. <clears throat> Do you get the conviction that they will be able that they are able to learn? Well, I'm on the wrong track. I just adjust the track. And sometimes, you know, people can be very stubborn. <laughs> they are. And you need to be a bit stubborn, but not too stubborn. <laughs> it's true. It's true. A little bit humble as well. <laughs> oh yeah, humble. Yeah, I, I, humble. I, good. Good point. My total conviction after all these years and all these investments is, you're always wrong. Always wrong. Yeah. How can you be always wrong? Well, you know, 30% or so of the investments failed. Obviously, you're wrong. But with the successful investments, the, especially the very successful, you were always also wrong. What do I mean by that? Quite honestly, you know, the biggest, biggest successes we did after 10 years or more, you know, when the companies that really, we just sold a company on Friday, last Friday, for 400 million. Guys, right out of university 12, 13 years ago. When we made the investment, first of all, the investment board declined it, and then we uh, we presented it again, <laughs> and then they accepted it. <laughs> and then and then uh, and then we had these these guys out of universities, they were like young guys and they looked a little bit funny because they were tickies. And and now, 12 or so or 13 years later, we sold the company for 400 million. And very, very honestly, we never ever would have thought this company would have would be able to grow into like a 400 million company. So we were wrong. When we made the investment, we did not see the huge potential. So you're always wrong. When the company fails, when it's a big success, you never know. So and that's the I think it's really important to know you're always wrong because you never know the future. And 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 then you just adjust along the way. That's completely true. <laughs> what is the perfect receipt for a grand pitch, if there is any? I think there's many, many pitches, and 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 the, the perfect receipt is to understand what's the goal of the pitch, and then to pitch for the goal. So, for example, you meet an investor at a conference, and 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 you know you meet someone and you start talking to him. So you know you have like a minute, two, maybe five minutes. So the goal of that pitch is to get a pitch, you know, to be invited to the office for an hour or two hour pitch. So when you have a minute or two at a conference and you start uh, laying out all the claims and the patent, <laughs> then your time is over before you, for the investor has a chance to understand what it's all about. And <clears throat> So uh, when there's a first pitch in the office, then of course the goal is to, to get to know each other. It's not an investment decision because after the first pitch, we don't make an investment decision. We don't say, well, here's half a million, just go with it. So the goal is to convince the investor to dig deeper into it. And then of course, then the, maybe then there's the investment pitch and then, then the goal is to get the investment. So I think the perfect pitch really understands what the goal of the pitch is and, and addresses the goal. What's your suggestion for funders when they approach, one thing is pitching, but I'm talking about approaching investors, how they should approach an investor. Directly or with a very good, uh, of course, reference and honestly and open. Uh, and really understanding that the investor is, not an expert in the field. So it, 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 it's logically he cannot be, he or she cannot be an, an expert exactly in the field because it's innovation, it's something new. So, so it's important to, to be open, to be honest, very, very important to be honest. And, um, and then to, to give the investor a chance to understand. I have done you know, software programming. I'm a little bit became an expert in the crypto space. But if there's a new, very innovative um, 
like technology approach in the crypto space. I don't understand it because it's new. <laughs> and then it's important to not lose the investor, but to give them a chance to, to catch on, to follow. Because if, if you lose him or, or her, then he might not get it. And then he might not invite you for, a, for, the, next, for the next pitch. It's important to make sure he or she understands what you're talking about. Me, I think you are very well positioned to, for this topic. What about IP? How is it important for you the IP belong to the company to invest? To it is imp it's important. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I mean, like, like all the patents, uh, you know, like in the hardware and, and the tech space and biotech, you know, there's patents and, and technology and everything. It, it, it's really important that that belongs to the company. Sometimes, you know, some not so important IP can be licensed, uh, but but. Important IP needs to be in the company. Uh, first of all, you need to have it in the company to further develop it because you know it's not perfect, so it needs to go on. But then also in the exit discussions, uh, we do see um, you know, uh, acquirers that that look at the number of patents and how solid you know, the patent is, or is the source code really does it really belong to the company, or does it belong to some external? developer that's very important <laughs> so it's important it's it, it's important but it's just one thing that's important i don't think that's also important we need to be close with what would be the best and most promising sectors for founders to get involved where they start their venture yeah yes <laughs> I, I think innovation is happening everywhere and, and, and there's so many sectors, you know, the whole energy sector, the whole climate sector, of course, is very important. It's important. And then there's new business models popping up because things are changing. Um, medtech, biotech, you know, we're still sick and we still have many diseases we cannot cure that, that, that make our life really hard. Um, and, 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 and curing cancer, of course, and, and, and uh, Alzheimer and, and many other things that's of course, very important. And then also, of course, um, you know, we have aging societies in, in Western Europe, in Germany, Japan, all over the place. Of course, uh, you know, when the baby boomers um, are in nursery homes, uh, then there's not enough people to take care of them. The, the whole robotic field uh, uh, opens up. I personally, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan. I think uh, if I was to set up a company, it would be in the, in, the, in the crypto space. It would be specifically also in the Bitcoin space. Because I think what we see here is the next Internet of Value, which is will be as big or even bigger than, than the Internet that we know today. Uh, so we have huge problems with our currencies that, that have huge inflation uh, and, and the financial system excludes uh, like 3 billion people in the world. And, and Bitcoin uh, promises to be much more inclusive. You, know, you just need a smartphone and Internet. Uh, and, and I think the financial system is very, very inefficient expensive and uh, <laughs> not so good for many people. So, so I think uh, that's a huge, huge, huge uh, universe. But then there's other huge universes. Um, just pick a big problem and there's so many big problems uh, in the world that, you know, I, need, I mean, there's many, many, many opportunities. I would pick Bitcoin. Would you invest in Metaverse one day? Uh, yeah, we've done it. Uh, we, uh, we've, We've just made an investment in a company that that um, that um, uh, creates photorealistic plants for the metaverse. Um, would I buy land in the metaverse? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> it, it, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, it's just it's popping up and then it's changing quickly, and things will vanish again, and then they pop up again. I think the metaverse. Um, definitely provides huge opportunities uh, brand extensions uh, entertainment yeah. uh, escaping a horrible world <laughs> sometimes horrible world definitely anything that's new uh, might not work of course but it's fascinating by itself and then you know, would i look at it yes definitely i agree i agree i'm, I'm already imagining a world where we, we don't touch the ground i mean yes we stay home we interact from home and we just go out for, it's going to happen. <laughs> That's going to happen. It's going to happen. I mean, w w watching a movie is, 
of course great and then sometimes you really uh, fall into the movie but it's a two-dimensional thing and there's 3d movies that that create give you a headache but you know just you could easily imagine that that you know when we look back in 10 years or so we we we, we say well do you remember when we watched the 2d movies <laughs> that was like 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 black and white yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and and then and then you, you you jump into the metaverse and you, uh, you you maybe it's not just watching a movie but interacting with a movie, and and you can easily dream or imagine uh, or foresee uh, scenarios that might be very exciting. It does. I'm mean, I'm really excited. Yeah, myself as well. Alex, thank you so much for coming <laughs> to the talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been a very good pleasure. Thank you so much.